Hey everybody, I'm John McDonough, and we're going to talk today about um, you're writing too much code and what a good API, and maybe it should have been what a good API SDK can do for you. Uh, if you saw earlier with the, um, the shout outs, I do work for Cisco DevNet. Um, I was going to sing that, but um, my wife talked me out of it. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, John A. McDonough, at John A. McDonough, um, I'll never tweet anything political, never, because you don't care what I think. Um, I'll never tweet a, you know, like silly stuff, like a picture of my food that I'm eating. Unless it's like food in the shape of code, then um, you're not going to see it from me. It's just going to be purely technical or some goofy retort to some other technical thing. It's all about technical. And um, anyway, if you want to follow me. So who am I? I'm John McDonough. I'm a developer evangelist for Cisco. I'm a developer advocate. I go and talk about writing code. So I work for DevNet and I write code. I've been writing code for 40 years. 40 years. I'm 51 and I started when I was 11. I sold my first program when I was 11. Okay, it was written in basic. And I sold it to the guy that my dad worked for and I thought this has got to be the easiest way to make money. I quit my paper and I didn't sell another piece of code until ever, until I worked for somebody when I graduated college. But anyway, I talk about writing code. Um, I talk about code, I talk about writing code, and I write okay code. Even though you think I've been doing it for all these years, it would be pretty good. It's just, it's okay. It's in, and your, your code is okay too, probably, and that's okay. Uh, I talk pretty good, um, well. And I've been doing this for like over 30 years, and actually, when I did the math today, it's actually, um, 40 years. And I contribute to Ansible. And um, my Ansible contribu contributions are better than OK only because of the standards that they make me adhere to. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? What do I know? What's an API? It's all questions. Um, what's an SDK? What's an object model? What's a good SDK? I forgot the question mark. Read some docs. What's Python got to help? What's data encoding? What did I do? And what do you know now? It's a lot of questions. Only one statement in there. Um, hopefully, it'll, it'll be interesting and it'll, it'll be worth your while. So what do I know? I don't know much, but it's enough, right? I don't know like 20 different languages, but I know how to write Python code and other language coding. But a lot of times what I do is when I used to do, um, uh, you know, like paid work for, for advanced services in Cisco, I'd ask the customer, what, what language do you want me to write it in? And I'd write in, I'd know enough about that, or with their, with their standards documentation, I'd be able to figure it out. Uh, you have to know how to encode data in JSON or YAML, and even XML. XML still works. It's, it may not be the prettiest thing, but it still works. You have to know how to use something like GitHub and Git. You have to know how to Google. So I was talking to a colleague of mine, he said, uh, He's like, oh, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you feel about Googling code? I was like, well, how do you feel about looking at a book, right? What's the difference, right? I just, if you, if you Google code or if you look at a book, just make sure you know what it does. So I, I'm not one of these guys like, oh, you, you Google that code? Oh, you're really like lesser, part. no, it's just like looking at a book. Here's the most important thing. I know about the thing that I'm working on, and I know it very, very well. And if you're going to automate something, if you're going to DevOps a thing, you have to know it. You can't just sort of wing it and think you know this thing or what it's going to do. You have to know it. And the way to write less code is to know how that thing works. All right, so first, what's an API? So I found these two quotes. I'm going to show you these quotes. An, IP, an API, applica, Application Program Interface, is a set of programming instructions and standards for accessing a web-based software application or a web tool. A software company releases its API to the public so that other software developers can design products that are powered by its service. I was like, wow, that's a lot of words. But it's very specific, a web-based surf, whatever. I didn't like what Dave wrote. So I found this one. An API is a set of routines, programs, and tools for building software applications. Basically, an API specifies how software components should interact. Additionally, APIs are used when programming graphical user interface components. A good API makes it easier to develop a program provide. Again, I didn't like what Vanjie wrote either. It's so much stuff. There's so many words here. So I, I have a quote, and you're going to see this quote all over now after today. 
An API, Application Programming Interface, is a first level direct mechanism through which programs can communicate with and manage a thing. That's what an API does. It's a first level interface through which programs can communicate with and manage a thing. It's me, and you can reference it. It's on this slide. These were actually on the internet, but here it is. It's on this slide. What's a good API? So I'm going to take it one step further. A good API is a first level direct mechanism through which programs can communicate with and manage a thing. And that mechanism provides all or more of the features found in the thing's other interfaces. All right? It's all or more of the features found in the thing's other interfaces. Again, me. And this is what you want to reference is this slide. So typo, what's an, SD, what's an SDK? So Namku, NamQU came up with this. At the simplest level, and this is not a simple quote at all, an SDK is made up of lines of code written by a third party that can be added to digital applications and support new capabilities, and while SDKs are widely associated, no, 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 no. It's like, this is not an SDK, or, or lines of code written by a third party. I work for Cisco, we wrote our own SDK. Am I now a third party to, so this isn't an SDK. All right, this is my last me quote that I attribute to me, I think. A software development kit is a second level or higher, because we're talking about abstractions, a second level or higher collection of coded actions that are more convenient, more manageable, and enable more options than an API does to manage a thing. So remember, a good API added more, the same or more features than are available in the other interfaces. Now an SDK offers more manageable and enables more options than an API does to manage a thing. Why would you use an SDK or a particular language binding if it didn't offer something better than the API? Now the thing that I work on at Cisco is something called the UCS or the Unified Compute System. Its API is written in XML. It's not REST. It's RPC XML. You craft XML, you stick it in the body of a post, um, and you, you get something back. Even if it's a 200 OK, that doesn't mean it worked. You still got to look at it. The API is fine. You can write a bunch of stuff in that XML, but it's not very manageable. So we made some Python SDKs, and we made some PowerShell SDKs, and we made some Ruby and some Java and some other ones. But those SDKs provide more capabilities, and they're more manageable. All right. So, how does it work better than the, than the API? It has an object model, and an object model defines all the objects that the thing has, whether they be logical or physical. So the object model says, these are all the things that the API can manage, in th these objects that we can manage. And then the object model can tell you where in the model, and this one happens to be hierarchical. It doesn't have to be, but this one happens to be hierarchical. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have the tree where an object that re represents a VLAN might live in the tree and then what it may have associated with it. And then the object model also tells us what its class type is and some of the attributes. It tells us um, how it's named, um, the first version it appeared in, and uh, who has rights to it, its children, et cetera. It tells you a bunch of stuff about the things that the API manages. This is metadata. This is the object metadata. Also in the object model, the object model defines all the attributes that an object can have and all the possible values that each attribute can have. So in this case, the object model just doesn't tell us about the objects and where they live in the tree and et cetera, and stuff like that. It tells us every attribute that the object has and every possible value that an object can have, whether it be a range, a pattern, or from a value set. In this case, I don't know if you can really make it out all that well, but on the, um, on the left-hand side, that's the ID attribute of a VLAN. And you can see that it tells us in the properties that it has a minimum value um, from, I don't know, my glasses on. It has a minimum range of one, that's one L, so along. 
to, 40, to 4,029, and then there's a gap, and we can go to, from 4,048 to 4,093. So those are the acceptable values for a VLAN in my system that I'm working on. That's a range operator. If you look on the right-hand side, and it's kind of off the screen, but on the very bottom there, there is a, um, a regular expression for the name of the VLAN. So the object metadata tells us how um, or what are valid values for the attributes. And so that's pretty cool. So we got an API and we got an object model. Well, then the SDK came, SDK came along and merged those things together. And now I have programmatic access to the object model, to all the metadata that goes along with the, um, the objects in, in the API. So I want to amend my good SDK. I want to say that it's the same thing it was before. It, is more convenient, more manageable, and enables more options than the API does to manage a thing. And the SDK knows everything about the object model, and the objects, and the attributes, and the values of the attributes, and the types of those values, and the valid ranges, and the patterns or value sets that are allowed as values for those attributes. That's object metadata in the SDK. So you get where I'm going with this. A good API allows us to interact with the thing with more, the same or more features than are on the other interfaces. The SDK takes more information about the thing, all the metadata, and brings it together with the API. Again, I said it was my last quote, but see, it's me, and you can always reference this slide if you needed to. So, a good way to write less code is to read the docs. You gotta read the docs. And Anne uh, Gentle is my, uh, is my colleague, and she talked about writing docs this morning. Um, somebody wrote those docs. You know, they went in and they said, welcome to UCSM SDK's documentation. That's the Unified Compute System Manager SDK documentation. And there's pages and pages of it. It tells you about the managed objects. It tells you about the methods. It tells you about the information model. It tells you everything you need to know. So you... Is this still working? Yeah, we're working. Somebody wrote those docs for you and you make them ugly cry because you know they put a lot of time and effort. Doc, as Dan Gentle said this morning, doc writes people too. And I do want to talk about measurement and validation of measurement. This picture right here is a valid measurement of pain. Because I did find this on the internet. So up to hurts even more. Just a cartoon face worked. But they couldn't actually draw a cartoon face that conveyed how James Vanderbeek felt. And that's how, you, that's how doc writers feel when you don't read their, their docs. But doc writers are, are realistic. They know it doesn't hurt that. It doesn't hurt Kim Kardashian. But don't, don't worry. But there was not cartoonish face depiction. Anyway, so it is a real measurement. Just uh, pulling that out of anywhere. Don't make them ugly cry. So how does Python help you write less code? And I'm pulling it all together. It's going to come together in the end here. You'll see. Python has something called, um, or has an ability to dynamically load a module, and has the ability to inspect a module or an object. Now, I, great I got this great tool here for slides. Check that out. It's pretty cool, right? I didn't write it, but I am going to give some props to the people that did. Um, what's the info here? In case you ever want to do some slide stuff, it's a free plugin. It's called um, Code Presenter Pro. Um, but just just so you know, this is how I did this stuff in the in the in the um, in the PowerPoint. You can go in here, and actually, it's got some pretty cool features. If you have a lot of code, it lets you jump back and forth and whatever. So. The top two lines of code are purpose-specific code from that, that SDK that I talked about, I showed the docs for. And so the first thing, and if you have any Python code or any kind of code where you have to import something, you're familiar with this. You have to import the class or the recipe how to make that object. You have to import it. And then you have to instantiate that object and make, make it into something before you can go ahead and send it back to the system and create it. So that's pretty cool, but that's purpose specific. Now, of course, I could have variableized the things in that VLAN line and, and read them in from a file, what have you. But Python lets you dynamically 
um, load modules. So I could create dynamically adapting code. So I can create something that says my managed object module, and I can import the module and say whatever that, modu whatever that variable for module is. It could be that fabric VLAN import. And then I could look into the module, and I can dynamically inspect it. I can say, get me the attribute that is the module class. And now that module class holds a string that says what the class name is, and I can pull that out. And then I can dynamically, or I can populate that object by just passing in a bunch of keyword args, like ID equals this, name equals this, and so on and so forth. So I saw this and I got this idea. And the reason I got this idea was my coworker had sent me, it was, it was literally like 1,000, 1,500 lines of code to do a deployment of, of a system. And every block, every function was a purpose written function. Make this thing, make this thing, make this thing, make this thing. And I thought there's got to be a better way. Because anytime you want to make a change to that, that object, you got to go back into that code. Oh, let's see here. So I thought, well, how can I pull the data out of my, of my program, like that VLAN name and that VLAN ID and the module name and the class name? How can I pull that out of my Python code? And what I thought was, well, I could do something like, like JSON, where I could say, okay, module is the name of the LAN, uh, the, the module um, that I want to import, and then the class would be the fabric name or fabric land cloud. Make that bigger. Um, and then I could define this sort of structure here that's kind of hierarchical that looks like the object model. That's pretty, you know, I could do that and I could say when I want to go into the land cloud and add, a, add some VLANs, I have to say, all right, well, those VLANs are children of the land cloud. And so I can structure my, my JSON in that way or I could structure my YAML in that way. Let's see if I can make this bigger. All right, so I, I thought about encoding this data that would drive my program. So I pulled it all out into JSON or YAML, or you could do XML, it still works. I thought, okay, well now, if I could take that, that encoded data and somehow import the things that I need to import, instantiate the things that I need to instantiate, um, and then read my data in from, from those files, well, I could do everything in just a big, giant, recursive loop of stuff, right? Well, that was cool, because then I could just take, I could write little config files, or I could write big config files, um, and I'm not writing purpose-specific code anymore, so here's what I did. Let's start with some purpose-specific code. So this creates a VLAN. It's pretty straightforward. I import uh, a connection module, and then I import the class for the VLAN. I connect, I instantiate a connection um, object, and I connect to my management system, the thing. I um, instantiate this, this VLAN, and then I add it, and I commit it, and I log out. This is a piece of, this is 15 lines of purpose-specific code to create a VLAN. There are over 9,000 objects in a UCS system. So depending on the thing that you're working with, whether it be a network switch, whether it be a, um, a, U, a compute system, whether it be something else, has 9,000 objects, more than 9,000 objects. And those objects can be created, they can be updated, they can be deleted, etc. So I thought if I was going to write one of these, and this is a very tiny, small amount of attributes object, I would have to write thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code, of purpose-specific code. So I thought that that's not, that's not achievable. That's not viable. So what I did was, like I showed you earlier with the encoding, I took the entire configuration that I want to make and I put it in this JSON file. And this JSON file is, it's long, it's 266 lines. 
But it defines everything. It defines the module. It defines the class. It defines the, the hierarchical structure. It defines the, uh, the attributes. And it pulls it all in there. All right, so it's 266 lines of configuration. But it can configure anything. So at the very top, I have two sections of this file. I have a connection section. It connects to my, my management module, my thing. And then I have an object section. The object section is just a list, an array of things that I want to make. And with each one of those things, it can be a standalone thing or it can have children. So remember, I wrote 15 lines of code to manage one thing. But then I created this object, um, sort of this, this definition of my configuration in JSON or YAML. And I realized that I could do a depth first traversal of my JSON and make those things. As soon as I hit the, the last child or a thing, well, I would commit it all, and then I would go and hit my next object. So I do this depth first traversal of my JSON where I start the objects, and my first thing in there was the land cloud, and I see it has two children, and then I come up to my organizational structure, and I see my organizational structure has two children, but then my prod east organization has data center 01 and data center 02. But this is the case for all my objects. I just have to understand in the SDK what module to load, what class to instantiate, and what attributes to give it, and if there are children. And you can go as deep as you want. You could go seven children deep, 10 children deep, however many it is for, to create that object, depending on the system that you're working on. So I did that. Let me make this bigger. And of course, there's you know, your, your standards and your logging that you do. But I created this traverse method. And what this traverse method does is it looks down that tree. It's a, it's a um, recursively called method. And I start by just importing that JSON file or the YAML file, depending on um, you know, how it's encoded. And I just keep calling this function until I get to the bottom of that, that group. And it turns out that in, with a little bit of logging, of course, there's, no, there's not too much error handling here. But with about 61 lines, including the blank lines of code, I can create, update, or delete over 9,000 objects. I've taken the configuration and I've made that its own thing. The code that is the, the real power here is this dynamic module loading. Right? It lo dynamically loads the module. Well, this is for the connection class, so let me move back up to the top here. I can dynamically load the modules, and I can instantiate the class. And if this is a parent class, or if it's not a parent class, I can just say, well, the parent thing that you made before recursively. But if it's a parent class, I could say, you know, these, um, these attributes. But the idea here is I've totally removed from my code any of the configuration. So think about what your SDK or your, or, or your SDK can do for you, and can you do operation? Because if you can do this kind of situation, you can go ahead and write code here that never changes. I don't want to say never. That's silly to say never. But um, it, has no, it has no awareness of the thing that it's making. All the awareness of the thing that's being made is in the configuration file. You've totally separated it. So this code right here, or some semblance of this code, is actually going to be it's um, it's uh, going to be an Ansible 2.6. Our catch-all um, object met, uh, management piece, because we realize that with something like Ansible, we have to write a lot of purpose-specific code. Right? If you've if anybody's done any Ansible contribution, you have to write the, the, um, the doc section, and then you write the section that takes the object and does something based on um, what's, in your, what's in your YAML, whether you delete it, update it, create it, whatever it may be. So we're going to write a lot of purpose-specific code. But since we have over 9,000 objects, I thought there's no way we're going to be able to write all those. So we're gonna, we've as one of the modules in Ansible. It'll, come, it'll be in Ansible 2.6, so that if there's anything that we haven't written yet, you can use this. You can specify in YAML 
the, um, and actually you can specify in JSON too, but you can specify in YAML what it is that you want to create and or delete and with this code, or this is the code we'll be doing it, it was that we can provide access to everything. We don't have to say to people, hey, wait to or download our, um, you know, our piece on our site that's not yet in Ansible 2.6. Kind of like right now with, with the product that I work on, in Ansible 2.5, we have some stuff in there. Um, but we also have a bunch of stuff that didn't make it in yet. So we say download from here to get all um, the stuff, or when you download Ansible, you get all the regular stuff that's included with it. But when you then supplement what we haven't put in there yet, but this code will cover everything, all 9,000 objects. So this is how you end up writing less code. You have to know what the SDK offers. You have to know what the language offers. But if you do, you can totally separate out the data or the config data from the, from the program itself. So now what do you know? I mean, I, I'm not that arrogant that you think my definitions are good, but um, what I think a good, a I should have wrote that, what I think a good API is, what I think a good SDK is, and you know that you have to read the docs. There is stuff in there, you know, somebody put in there, or they, they made that, or they created it's going to be something in the API that's good for you. Um, Python reflection and dynamic modules are very good. I know I've read some things where, you know, they're costly. So if you're writing a heads up embedded system for a fighter plane, maybe you shouldn't write those. But uh, if you're just writing something to configure your switch, your computer, something like that, I think you could do that. Uh, share your code, your ideas, uh, my code is all, is all out there on the internet uh, in GitHub. Uh, less code is less, but less code that does more is more. Anytime you write more code, you get more bugs. Um, I think that you could do more with less to, if you really utilize the SDK to, to a great extent. And um, I recently wrote a blog about it. Uh, this is just my blogger profile on, on Cisco.com. Um, but I recently wrote a blog called How to Deploy UCS Manager with Environment with Far Less Python Code. That's not the title that I picked. That's the title that Mark picked. But um, my, my blogs always have code. They're not marketing fluff that tell you how great a product is. This is kind of what we talked about today. So if you're interested, you can go and uh, search out John McDonough on blogs at Cisco.com and you can get that. If you want to go to um, GitHub, my user ID is moving a lot, M-O-V-I-N-A-L-O-T. And I have stuff up there. I have this code up there, but I also have stuff up there for using uh, an echo to manage your Twitter. Um, and then also I'm on Twitter. And you can follow me. Um, like I said, nothing political, only technical, or snappy retorts um, about, uh, did I say nothing political, only political? Nothing political, only technical, and only um, stuff about um, technical stuff or response to technical stuff. So hopefully that was informative. A um, few people in the back went to grab pillows. That's I'm not a fan. Um, but thanks for coming. Or if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So the, the specific, the question was, what was the thing in, in Ansible that's upcoming in 2.6? So for the UCS, uh, the Cisco Unified Compute System Ansible modules, we have modules in there for, for managing BIOS settings, boot order, um, you know, things like that. But since we couldn't write, well, there's not enough of us to write functionality for everything. This module that we're, we're adding in there with this code in it is a sort of like a generic catch-all. You just supply the, um, the attributes and their values in the, in the YAML file, and it will know which uh, well, you're, you're going to tell it what, what uh, modules to load, I should say, from the Python SDK. But you, it'll, based on that stuff, you don't have to write a purpose-specific module. It's more like a generic catch-all. Like it's a config management module. Yep. Thank you. Well, all right. Uh, oh, sure.
Yeah, so the question is the dependency. So, um, and, and that's, a good, that's a good question because you do run into dependency issues. Like you can't create this thing and this thing at the same time because they're mutually exclusive or there's the dispense in the other. So that comes down to knowing the thing that you're working on, right? So when we do um, like port configuration, like uplink configuration, you can't create a port channel if your uplink ports don't exist yet, right? In the object model, the object model for creating a port channel just says pull these links in. But it doesn't tell you that these things are mutually exclusive. It comes out to the data management engine that's running behind the scenes for the thing. So it depends on how your thing works. So the object model doesn't truly reflect the dependencies, um, but it does reflect containment. So if, the, if it's containing a thing, and you want it to contain that thing, and that thing doesn't exist yet, well, then it can't contain it, right? So you have to understand dependency mapping. What I see th from an object point, which would be really, really cool, not just attributes, things like that, but as well as localization data, field labels, right? Because then you could just, in your code, say you, were, you want to throw up a web page that said fill in these fields and these values. Your code doesn't have to be um, coded up with all this hard coded stuff. It could pull that metadata from the object model and just build the page based on that in the proper locale based on that. So I think the object model has a long way to go um, it's good, but it has a long way to go to really fulfill all that needs. And, I, and the one thing, I know we talked about it in the, the morning's keynote about generating APIs or generating SDKs or language bindings. The, the UCS um, um, SDKs and PowerShell libraries are all generated, like 99% well, like generated. So, um, like the, the PowerShell module has over 6,000 commandlets in it, and only about maybe 17 or 18 are written by 